Hello, everyone. Welcome to Prophecy Roundtable. Man, tonight we are going to be talking about the prophetic implications of the Hamas Israel war. Now, there are a lot of different positions on what this could possibly mean. Look, I lived over there for three years and things would happen and we'd get right back to work. The Israelis would be right back to work. And, you know, sometimes people in America were like, oh, no, this is the end. But of course, it wasn't right. And then things were going crazy in 2005, and that wasn't the end. Is this the end? Well, none of us knows, of course, but it does seem different this time. It seems like we are on the edge of something, and it may not blow over like it did before. Now, to help us uh, just kind of weed through some of these different uh, issues and uh, considerations, I am excited to bring on an old friend of mine, uh, Bill Salas. And um, we're going to have a great conversation. So, Bill, it really is a pleasure to have you on the show. Welcome. Hey, Doug. Thanks. Good to be with you and Scott tonight. Yeah, absolutely. Bill, why don't you tell everybody uh, where you are and, you know, kind of some of the things you've written so that our audience can get up to date with your stuff. Well, I'm a Southern California man, much like you used to be, Doug. Uh, and I have a website called prophecydepot.com. I'm the founder of Prophecy Depot Ministries. And I've got a product store there with, I've got 11 books and 11 DVDs. A lot of the DVDs are companion to the books. Uh, so we've got stuff on Bible prophecy, of course, the Mideast Wars, Psalm 83, Jeremiah 49, Nuclear Showdown in Iran, Prophecy on Elam. A lot, of, a lot of people haven't really paid attention to that prophecy, which may be coming to light in light of what's going on. We've got a Here to Eternity series. What could happen between now on the way through the tribulation on through to the messianic kingdom on into the eternal order so we've got a whole uh, menu of books that can get you from here to eternity <laughs> there you go absolutely mm -hmm. all right well um you know in, in your estimation what feels different about you know this current situation versus the previous ones you know there's a lot of saber rattling before I remember 2005, Ahmadinejad of um, Iran was saying all kinds of stuff, and they were working on getting uh, nuclear, you know, enrichment and all that different stuff. And, you know, it kind of came and went. And what do you think is different now? Well, we'll narrow the focus down initially to the Hamas-Israel conflict. Of course, that's what we're all watching right now with bated breath. Will it escalate? Will Hezbollah get deeper into the fray? Will Syria join in, etc.? Will Iran join in? But in the past, you know, Hamas versus Israel has not been a you know new thing. I mean, there's been skirmishes quite some time now. Hamas was like that boxer that would go in a ring and lead with his chin, right? And, and then he'd hope that Hezbollah and other Arab countries and populations would join in the fight. But they never really did. And so they would take a shellacking, but they'd rearm themselves and come back, you know, to fight again. <clears throat> this time it's different because... It looks like this was very well orchestrated with the assistance of Iran. Uh, what they pulled off, breaching the fence, uh, coming through on bike, motorcycles, coming through the sea, uh, piloting on inside, you know, coming in on uh, through the air as well as they dropped in on parachutes and things. Now that's well orchestrated. You wouldn't expect Hamas and their, uh, their limited capabilities and skills to be able to pull that off. So everyone's sort of attributing this to Iran's training. In fact, recently a headline came out and said that I think it was about 600, I don't know the exact number, uh, fighting Hamas, trained militia, Hamas soldiers were actually training a few weeks ago back in Iran. <clears throat> so we would suspect that those that were training in Iran were probably some of the ones that, that you know attacked Israel in this back on October 7th. So I, I just think, that, and, and also now you have Hezbollah getting involved on a limited engagement up to the north, but they're causing Israel to evacuate about 30 communities up there, several thousand people. Uh, Israel's amassed about 10 plus thousand to 10,000 or more troops up there. Syria is, of course, now coming into the fray. Israel has taken out the Damascus airport and the Aleppo airport. Of course, that's nothing new. It's, Israel does attack Syria on a frequent basis. But, I mean, there, it seems like everything is really kind of coming together. And I personally think, if this escalates, it could lead to prophetic implications like you started your show, like perhaps Psalm 83, perhaps Isaiah 17, 
the destruction of Damascus, perhaps the G Iran involved in the Jeremiah 49 prophecy and other related prophecies to those three. Right. So Psalms, or excuse me, <clears throat> Isaiah 17, you know, people may not know what that is all about. I actually uh, talked about that in Read Genesis Code. That is my fiction account of the end times. Don't worry, guys. More books are coming, working on it. Okay. But uh, in, in that book, we, um, we, we suggested that, you know, it might get nuked. Maybe there's a dirty nuke or something that comes in. It talks about it being uh, raised to the ground is going to be a ruinous heap. Uh, Bill, what, I mean, how close do you think we might be? Of course, nobody knows. Nobody has a crystal ball. But kind of your sense or what do you think could precipitate such an attack if that's kind of where you see things going? Well, <clears throat> the Isaiah 17 is 18 verses and three of the most poignant ones, I'll, I'll quote for you here, but then there's also the other you know 15 that are extremely important that a lot of people don't really take a close look at <clears throat> so let's look at the main three um the, the reason to answer your question the reason i think israel and israel is the one responsible that's in verse nine i'll quote that in a moment <clears throat> the reason i think israel takes out damascus the oldest continuously inhabited city in recorded history dating back to the time of abraham is because i believe they have to they find themselves engaged in a prison rules war probably by the surrounding countries, probably the proxies of Iran. And they really have little choice but for their existence, but to make a statement and take out an Arab city. So Isaiah 17, 1 says, Behold, the burden against Damascus. Behold, Damascus will cease from being a city. It will be a ruinous heap. <clears throat> it will be reduced to rubble. Isaiah 17, 9 says, uh, Not only Damascus, but other strong cities or major cities uh, will be the desolation in those major cities caused by the children of Israel. Now let's stop there for a minute because yeah. uh, some people think Isaiah 17 is found fulfillment back in 732 BC by the Assyrian Empire. Uh, what I what I caution people on is that Isaiah talks about Assyria or the Assyrian Assyria 37 times in books. Assyrian times, but he never talks about him at all in Isaiah 17. But he does talk about the children of Israel causing the desolation. Am I still on or are we having technical Yeah, you're, you're, you were breaking up for a second, but you're good now. Yeah, sorry about that. If you could maybe just repeat the last thing you said there. Sorry about that. Okay. Um, well, what I was talking about is how it was not fulfilled historically by Assyria in 732 BC. Some like Mark Hitchcock and Andy Wood would argue that. But... It's told, we're told Isaiah 17, 9, it's caused by the children of Israel. Isaiah 17, 14 says, When night you see him, speaking of Damascus in the masculine pronoun, but in the morning he is no more. This is the portion of those who plunder us and a lot of those who rob us. Picturing Israel having to, in self-defense, take out the city of Damascus overnight. Now, I believe, like you said at the opening of the question, <clears throat> that this could involve a strategic nuclear weapon bursted at the right altitude, which could be, and I'm not a physicist here, but I think it's 45 miles burst altitude above a city. And it'll take out the city, and it'll also have the mushroom cloud come up from that bomb, but it won't bring up all the particles of the earth and contaminate them because, of course, Tel Aviv is not too far away from Damascus. So Israel has to be careful about that. So I think that's a prophecy that could come into play uh, if things escalate. <clears throat> Wow. Um, you know, I was just looking at here. There's some interesting stuff here. Uh, so it says, um, you know, it shall be as when the harvester gathers the grain and reaps the heads of his with his arm. It shall be as he who gathers heads of grain in the valley of Rephaim. Uh, just an interesting, you know, um, reference there to the valley of Rephaim, which uh, is uh, basically very close to Israel, to Jerusalem. So um, I don't know, there's something kind of interesting there, but uh, well, wow. So you think maybe Israel might be the ones that would destroy it. That's uh, that's a new take. I hadn't considered that. Well, let me, <clears throat> let's talk about those verses you were looking at there for a moment, because like I said, there's other very important verses within the, the Isaiah 17 prophecy that are not often looked at. <clears throat> and I think this is one of the reasons Israel has to take out a city. Uh, Isaiah 17, 4 through 6 says that in that day, the day that Damascus is destroyed, 
the glory of Jacob will fade. Now that would be Israel. The, the glory would fade. The fatness of his flesh would become lean. Now that's not a good image for Israel. It goes on talking about, like you said, the the harvesting of the in Raphaim. But it talks it goes down to the, the wheat harvest. It's robust, like the harvest of the wheat. And then it goes and talks about the grapes. They're just gleaning some grapes. And then it talks about a shaking of an olive tree. So seasonally, you have a wheat harvest, then you have the grape harvest, and then you have it to the latter part of the year, you have the olive harvest. And I think the image Isaiah is painting here is that they start out pretty good. The harvest of wheat is good. But by the time they get into the war, the, the glory fades, the fatness of his flesh grows lean. It's like a shaking of an olive tree with two or, th two or three olives in the uppermost branches and three or four, four or five in the fruitful bough. And so I think what he's saying there is that, now remember, an olive tree, a, a fruited variety olive tree, which is the national tree of Israel, actually was nominated that a few years ago, can have 500,000 olives on it. And there's going to be this severe shaking of Jacob causing his glory to fade, his, his flesh to wane, the fatness of his flesh to wax lean. And there's going to be only a few olives left in the uppermost bough and a few in the, in the mid part of the tree. And I superimpose when I teach on this an olive tree over a map of Israel. And I show that on the olive tree at the top of it you have Haifa, and in the mid part you have Tel Aviv. And I believe that and you're already seeing Hamas lobbing missiles into Tel Aviv. Hezbollah's got 150,000 missiles that can hit anywhere inside of Israel. And I think we're going to get into a, they're going to get into a proxy war, and it's going to cause serious damage to Israel. As a matter of fact, there was a study done recently. I want to quote this for you. Uh, it says, this is the Israel National News. This came out, and it says, a predicted scenario, 6,000 rockets at Israel during first few days of war with Hezbollah, just Hezbollah alone. It goes on to say Israel's defense establishment is preparing for the worst case scenario during a war on the northern border, which would include days-long blackouts, hundreds dead, and thousands wounded. Now, we've already seen 1,400 dead from just the Hamas. Uh, this article came out on August 7th of 2023, and it goes on to say this. This is what's really telling. It says, within the first few days, about 6,000 rockets would be launched at the Jewish state. As time progresses, the number would decline to about 1,500 to 2,000 effective missiles. What they mean by effective missiles, so the first few days, 6,000. A couple of days into the campaign later, they're going to have 1,500 to 2,000 effective missiles landing inside of Israel, hitting precise targets. And these are ones that don't fall in indiscriminately in the fields or are not taken out by the Iron Dome. That's what they're saying is effective rockets. That's just Hezbollah. Uh, Syria has chemical weapons. They use their chemical weapons over 300 times in the revolution. And her articles were coming out recently saying that Iran is trying to get chemical weapons into Hezbollah's hands. So, you know, the, the situation, if it does escalate on the level, I presume it might. And we're watching it closely, especially now that Israel is starting to go into Gaza. They sort of paved the way here today as we speak for their ground incursion. And that may be what Iran was waiting for so before they have Hezbollah launch 6,000 missiles. I'm not saying that's that's where this is going, but it could. Uh, then that would be where you get to the position where you've got the proxy war going that I think shakes Israel like an olive tree. A question, um, just like some from verse 13, Bill. It, it, I'm just, I'm looking at this. I've always thought this might be at the very, very end of the age. And, and here's the reason why. It says the nations rumble on like rumbling of many waters, but he, speaking of God, will rebuke them and they will flee far away and be chased like chafe in the mountains before the, before the wind or like whirling dust before a gate. At evening time, behold, there is terror before morning. They are no more. And, and it certainly is in, in the, in the area as far as, you know, verse one and everything, but it, it, this seems to be, at least in my understanding currently, I, I'm likely to change that next week, Bill, but this, this has always seemed to me like a very end of the age, like shortly might even correlate with, uh, with say, shortly happening before Ezekiel 37 or, 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 or Ezekiel 37, uh, 38 and 39, like, like very, end. where, where would you place it, uh, as far as this, this, what, you know, if, if you, if you, if, if you, I'm sure you thought about it, would you place it 
years before, before the Great Tribulation, before uh, what some call Daniel's 70th week? Oh, yeah. I would place, I would keep everything in Isaiah 17 in context with the actual destruction of Damascus. Several times it mentions in that day. Uh, you know, verse four, I think it says it also 18. I don't, I don't have it in front of me. I like reading the NLT translation of what you just read, verses 12 and 13. And here's what it says. Listen, the armies of many nations. Now, let me stop there for a minute. Isaiah 17, 9 talks about there'll be desolation in strong cities in addition to Damascus, major Syrian cities. It's not just Damascus versus Israel. It's, I believe, all of Syria in this confrontation. Matter of fact, we find out what major cities are probably being spoken about when we go to Jeremiah chapter 49, verses 23 and 27. And I can go through that in just a moment. But it talks about there's trouble on the sea. Uh, Damascus and Hamath and Arpad are faint-hearted. Now, Arpad in the ancient times would be modern-day Aleppo, which Israel has taken out that airport about a few days ago that may be running again. I don't know. Hamath would be Homs and Hama. Now, these are major cities. Actually, Aleppo had, was, probably still is, the number one most populated city inside of Syria. So it talks about that we, in that day there'll be other cities taken out. So it's more than just Israel versus Damascus. Now, what the NLT talks about the roaring of many nations. So I think it's even more than just Syria versus Damascus. Yeah, I was including all the nations, sort of like a Zechariah 12 through 14 type of, type of situation, in which the nations are gathered against Jerusalem. In other words, not, um, you know, I mean, we've got all these passages and, and, and the main reason too is, is what about like, it, it's, for instance, there's, there appears to be good news and there's bad news in this prophecy for, for Jacob and for the sons of Israel, but it, there's also, it appears to be certain prophecies being fulfilled, which at least as applies to Judah, that won't really occur until Messiah actually returns. That's so, um, so Scott, what you're asking is, could it be that it starts off bad, obviously a little bit earlier on, and then it, there's a progression and that what happens toward the end of the chapter is actually toward the end of the, yeah, so yeah, like seven, I, you know, the so-called 70th week or the, you know, yeah, sort of like it starts now, but, the, but, but okay. as far as when Damascus is destroyed and looking at that, looking at that, uh, that cycle and Bill, you brought it up that, that harvest cycle. So we, we know we have the wheat, the barley in the spring, summer. We know we have the wine and the grapes that, that's mentioned at the, at the latter part. It could be that this, that this occurs. And, and I'm just thinking it's, I would not be dogmatic on this, that this could occur in that final um, uh, Moedim appointed time uh, feast cycle in the very last year of the age before Yeshua returns. I, and, and Bill, I believe he returns on the Yom Teruah. Uh, so, but, but and Doug, Doug and I, we disagree a lot. We actually agree on that. <laughs> we, we, we do a lot of bantering back and forth between the two of us where we differ. So well, I, I would, I would tend to, it's the burden against Damascus, this whole chapter in my estimation, referencing in that day several times, uh, as goes the armies of many nations roar like the roaring of a sea, hear the thunder of mighty forces as they rush forward. I think going against Israel in, in tandem like thundering waves, but though they thunder like breakers on a beach, God will silence them and they will run away. They will flee like chaff scattered by the wind, like a tumbleweed whirling before a storm. You mentioned Zechariah 12. Uh, I think Zechariah 12 too is not talking about the tribulation. I think it's talking about, it says, uh, when the nations round about, not the world, the nations at large, but the nations in the neighborhood that surround Israel, they will attempt to lay siege on Judah and Jerusalem. And it'll become like a cup of trembling to them when they attempt to do this. In fact, uh, it goes on to talk about, let me go there. I got it on my PowerPoint here real quickly. I, I put it on the screen if you want to check that out. Okay. Well, anyway, I, I, I know by memory. Okay, let me, let, me, let me get out of PowerPoint. Verse okay. 3 is what I would look at. And all the nations of the earth shall be gathered against it as opposed to That's just, not... That's not Zechariah 12, though. Yeah, it is. Um, this is Zechariah 12, 12 13. 12, 12, 12, 3, 3, verse 12, 3. 12, verse 3. Yeah. Okay, well, the way, the way I interpret well, Zechariah 14 actually talks about coming against Jerusalem, too. I thought that may be what you were alluding to. But uh, well, let, let me go to mine, because you might be moving around and get me confused here. <laughs> I understand. 
Yeah, I kind of I kind of feel like uh, Isaiah 17 yeah. might be referring to like it might it seems like a lot of these things you know it's kind of like it's focused and then it goes back to look at the entire big picture and you know we see in like Isaiah 24 I mean that is the tribulation it just kind of in one chapter like you know it's like this huge event you got the earth shaking it's not going to get up again it's like down for the count you know and so that seems to be a lot of what this is is that god is is sending out these prophecies of doom toward these various nations in relationship to how God is going to eventually and finally uh, save Israel at the very end, you know? So I would would not disagree with what you said, but I would disagree with putting that in Zechariah 12. Verse verse six is what I want to read. And it builds up to verse six. I can come back to Zechariah 12, verse 3, and tell you why I think it is actually dealing with what's going on presently in the international community, not related to Zechariah 14. But let's go to Zechariah 12, verse 6, because it puts on a very specific uh, detail here that I think we need to know about. It says that after the in, the in that day, and that's in that day that Jerusalem becomes a cup of trembling to the surrounding nations when they attempt to lay siege on Judah and Jerusalem. I will make the governors or the captains, so that's, I read that as the Israeli defense forces, uh, I will make them like a fire pan and a wood pile and like a fiery torch in the sheaves, and they shall devour all the surrounding peoples round about on the right hand and on the left hand. And those are the peoples that are going to lay siege on Judah and Jerusalem. And the Israeli defense forces exist in fulfillment of Bible prophecy, and this is one of the many places they show up, and, and and they only fight before the tribulation period. They're not involved in the tribulation. They're not involved in the Messianic kingdom. And I can how, how, how do you know that, Bill? How do you know that they're not involved? Well, because in the tribulation, in the first half, yeah. uh, the, the Israel's living in a pseudo peace. They they think they're okay. The false covenant's been confirmed. Okay. Uh, they're so complacent that they can't even stop the Antichrist from going into the temple at the mid part of the tribulation. In the second half, they're fleeing for their lives. Even Jesus said, when you see Matthew 24, 15, the abomination of desolation spoken by Daniel in the holy place, flee to the mountains. So I don't see them fighting anybody uh, in the first or second half. And in in the Messianic kingdom, Micah 4 tells us that the swords will be turned into plowshares, spheres into pruning hooks, and they will no longer learn war anymore. So I put Zechariah 12, those, those first six verses into modern times. And the defense forces are going to Would go. Would you have the house of David and the inhabitants of Jer- Jerusalem or Jerusalem at that point in time before what what you know you're you're calling a seven year tribulation? Because verse ten says, "And they shall look on me or to me whom they pierced, and they shall mm-hmm. mourn for him as one mourns for his only son, and they shall be in bitterness over him as bitterness over the firstborn." This seems to me like, and again, I would say this passage. Isaiah 17, I would have a weaker, I guess, understanding of it. Mm-hmm. This yeah. one, I would almost be dogmatic, get up on the table and say, no, this <laughs> is at the very end of the age. Well, I, I agree with you. I've read both <laughs> Millennium Prophecies and the New Jerusalem. And that latter part of Zechariah 12 is clearly talking about the resurrection of the Old Testament saints uh, and dealing with the Messianic kingdom. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not talking about the latter part of Zechariah 12. I'm talking about the first six six plus verses in Zechariah 12. I, I think your your take is somewhat unique because, I mean, the way I've always heard Zechariah 12 taught is that it's going to, it's referring to, uh, you know, the very end, the tail end of the Great Tribulation, you know, not, I mean, just shortly before the return of, of Jesus, um, you know, that this is going to be a uh, a stumbling block for all nations, right? He's going to bring all the nations of the earth against it. So I, I'm just curious. Uh, we don't need to get into this topic, but do you see Armageddon as an event that's happening in Jerusalem, or do you think it's happening up in the Megiddo Valley? Uh, well, I, I want to answer that question, but I, I, I used to struggle with Zechariah 12 as well, along the lines of what you're talking about, Doug. Uh, the way I would look at Zechariah 12, verse 3, the, the burdensome stone, to the nations that get involved. I think that's been going on. I mean, Israel becomes a nation in 1948. Jerusalem becomes an international zone. They're already meddling with Jerusalem. 
1967, uh, they, in 1949, they tried to divide Jerusalem with the, uh, the little divider line, the green line or whatever it's called. 1967, that didn't last because it's not biblically endorsed. Israel takes over all of Jerusalem. You see what we're, the American president's been trying to do, trade land for peace all this time. It's Jerusalem has been, and Israel, but specifically Jerusalem, has been a burdensome stone to the nations. They're, they're not going to be able to divide it and and mess with it. So I think... I would put all of Zechariah 12, 1 through 6 into a modern-day vernacular. As far as Armageddon, let me go into my my new Future War book, Prophecies book. I have 11 phases of Armageddon, wow. and I'm going to go there for you. 11 phases. Yeah, that's a topic we both uh, are very much passionate about. <laughs> I, guess I, I have yeah, phase yeah. number one, the fall of Jerusalem and the fleeing of the faithful Jewish remnant. I have phase number two, the Antichrist invades and desolates Egypt in Isaiah 11 and returns back to Israel area, promised land. And then phase number three, the Lord strikes the Antichrist's throne and shuts down his cashless economy. I believe that would be the fifth bowl. Uh, phase number four, the assembly of the Antichrist and his allied armies at Armageddon. I believe that's the Jezreel Valley. Uh, I have phase number five, uh, the deployment of some Armageddonites to Basra. Not all of his troops, but some to Basra. Phase number six, the national regeneration of Israel when they realize Jesus is the Messiah. And they say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Uh, phase number seven, the second coming of Jesus Christ when they recognize that. And he has a slaughter in Basra. Uh, phase number eight, there's that slaughter between Christ and the Armageddonites. Phase number nine, the assembling of the armies of Christ from heaven and returning. Phase number 10, the, valley, the battle in the Valley of Jehoshaphat. Phase number 11, the victory is sent up the mountains of olives and return of the Jewish remnant with Christ. So I have uh, hmm. two chapters devoted to those 11 phases. Interesting. Yeah, I, I would put the Valley of Jehoshaphat and the Valley of, uh, I, I think it's uh, actually Arimagedon. So it's the, uh, the sheaves in the Valley of Judgment or the Judgment of the Sheaves. Uh, in, in, you know, in that valley, that the valley that Jesus is going to create when he comes and he splits the mountain into two, that will be Arimagedon, and which is, of course, it'll be perpendicular to the valley of Yehoshaphat, where Yehovah judges. So I would put those uh, right next to each other. But that's another that's another whole discussion because <laughs> uh, well, it's yeah. commonly it's commonly taught that the Jezreel Valley is for the armies of I'm getting a symbol. I'm, I'm yeah, not, I, I know. I'm not I dogmatic about that. that. Yeah. Sorry? I'm not dogmatic about that, but that's, okay. I'm kind of, I kind of think that is where they do assemble. Um, the thing is, when he ascends to the Mount of Olives in Zechariah 14, a lot of people say, well, this is when that valley splits. There's an earthquake there. And, and it's pictures Jesus Christ, you know, balancing, doing a balancing act on the Mount of Olives. But we need to remember by the time he gets there, there's already been three major earthquakes. It could have, any one of those could easily have split that valley. Mm. So to mm. me, I, I'm suggesting that that earthquake has already happened by the time he gets there. You have I the one, of course, in Ezekiel 38. Okay. That's the major one. You have the, the great earthquake of the seventh bowl judgment, I think it was. And then mm. the, two, the two witnesses, there's a big earthquake there. Interesting. So, and I could be wrong on that one, but I find it, I just I think it's going to be interesting to think that Jesus is going to show up there and do this balancing act and have this major earthquake when there's already been three prior ones that are huge. <laughs> so you, well, what's interesting is there are four tectonic plates that meet there. And, uh, you know, I, I, I do think that, you know, my, my position is that Jesus will actually touch down. And when he does, it, that is when it uh, when it begins to split. And what I think is so exciting about that is that it is really a uh, a repeat of the red sea crossing right this is the second exodus right so here his people are between a rock and a hard place they are in the valley of jehoshaphat they know that he's coming to save the day uh but there's a pincer move that the antichrist is trying to do to destroy them from the north and from the south and then at the last possible minute uh, jesus comes and pff, there's salvation and uh, and, ver and regarding Zechariah chapter twelve verse six, uh, I have a a fun little spin on that, which is uh, I actually think I, I kind of can take that quite quite literally that um, 
the clans of Judah are going to be like a brazier that sets a wood pile ablaze or like a burning torch among sheaves of grain that they'll burn up all their neighboring nations. I think they're actually going to have fire coming out of their hands. And it says that the weakest will be like King David and the, the, the strongest or royal descendants here, but the strongest would be like God, like the angel of the Lord. And then so I take a look at Habakkuk chapter three, um, where it says that rays of brilliant light flash from his hands. So that's kind of my take on it. But it's always fun to, you know, hear how other people uh, are looking at these these passages. Uh, you know, it just kind of gives you something to chew on. So that's that's really cool. So we looked at Isaiah chapter 17, and I think you uh, have some some interesting uh, ideas. Uh, the other passage that we said that we might look at uh, was, I don't know, was it Ezekiel 38, 39, or did you want to look at Psalm 83? Well, we could look at Psalm 83. We could also look at Jeremiah chapter 49, verses Jeremiah 40. 49. Okay, let me let me go there to Jeremiah 49. Yeah. Well, one of the things about one of, one of the things about Psalm 83 that is good is I can show you a plethora of, I believe, related prophecies to like the umbrella prophecy of Psalm 83 that clearly show the Israeli defense forces. If, if you if you think Zechariah 12, 6 is vague, which which I I don't, but your interpretation was interesting. I can show you a plethora of prophecies where the Israeli defense forces are clearly there. We already talked about Isaiah 17, 9, desolation caused by the children of Israel. Uh, but there's all these these uh, confederates in Psalm 83, Hamas, Hezbollah, Syria, Iraq, Jordan, Egypt, um, Palestinians. They're so involved. I have in Psalm 83 uh, pulled up if you want to. Um, so, yeah, I know you've written extensively on this passage. Uh, you take it as something future. Some people think it's an imprecatory prayer that has already been fulfilled but um please share with us how you understand this okay i do take it as an unfulfilled future war prophecy i uh, in my book because there are who, those who think it's either been fulfilled in the past namely 1948 uh would be part of ezekiel 38 but there's reasons that's not the case or it's just simply an imprecatory prayer so i've had to address those objections since my psalm 83 book came out in 2000 and 13, uh, I've, I've had to address all those, and I do that in my Future War Prophecies book that I recently released uh, just a, a couple months ago. So Psalm 83, for the people who are not aware of it, talks about a confederacy that comes together, the first five verses, with a devious plan, and their goal is to destroy the nation of Israel, cut the nation off from being a nation that the name of Israel can be remembered no more. And Asaph goes through in verses, Asaph's the author of the psalm 3,000 years ago. He wrote 12 psalms. Psalm 83 is a prophetic one. He, we, we know he's a prophet because we're told in First Chronicles 29.30 that wherever King Hezekiah and the leaders commanded the Levites to sing praises of the Lord to the Lord with the words of David and Asaph the seer. Now, Doug, I'm going to mess this word up. It's, it's Choza, C-H-O-Z-E-H, so you probably know how to pronounce it better than me. But it means a boat beholder of vision. And there's other places where we find out he's a prophet. And I, I clarify that because, you know, he is, a, he is a, a worship leader of David, but he was also a prophet. And at a time when Israel was dwelling quite securely, they're, they're talking about building their temple. David had won their enemies, the very enemies. He'd won war against enemies, the very enemies that Asaph's going to, identify for us uh he, he gets this 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 prophecy which is nothing short of a genocidal attempt of at the nation of israel and the jewish people but he goes on to identify them by their ancient names he says the tents of edom he starts with them which makes them their their role very important because they're the first one listed among the 10 member confederacy and tents of biblically can represent refugee conditions and i show in my psalm 83 book how the Edomites have ethnical representation that goes back to uh, the Edomites. E they were fathered by Esau. And uh, so I believe we've got the Palestinian refugees there. He goes on and talks about the other people. And you'd have, inside of there, you'd have the Hamas, Hezbollah, Syria, Jordan, Egypt, the Palestinians, uh, and, and Saudi Arabia. 
And uh, so, th and these are the countries, by the way, that came against Israel in 1948. That's why some people think it was fulfilled at that time. But uh, I have uh, I have various reasons why I don't believe it was. Hey, Bill, let me. Can I ask you a question? So it says Philistia there. Uh, you know, Philistia had nothing to do. The Philistines had nothing to do with modern day Palestinians. That is simply um, a vestige of uh, Hadrian renaming uh, Judea to Palestina because he was so mad at uh, the the Jews for having a second Jewish revolt. Uh, you know, the, the Palest I mean, the Philistines, the ancient Philistines, were actually probably from Kaftor. They were a sea people. Uh, so essentially European, for lack of a better word. I know I'm, I'm using that anachronistically, but, you know, they were uh, definitely from uh, the West and they came and they settled there. Is there any, do we have any evidence at all that the, that there would be, uh, that, it, that it's wise to make a connection between Philistia and the Palestinians? Well, you're, you're correct in your history. I agree with you. Um, I, all I know is that the Palestinian refugees are not just in the West Bank. There are some in the Gaza. There are some in Lebanon and Jordan and scattered to various parts of the Middle East. Mm -hmm. So I think what we have, ASAP's listening, is in the vernacular of his time, uh, that territory there where you have the Hamas today is going to be involved in the Confederacy of Nations and po terrorist populations, if, it, if it's for our time, that will come against Israel in the final attack. They'll be the ones that try to lay siege on Judah and Jerusalem. I believe that's part of a peripheral prophecy as well. Um, there's actually four prophecies that the Hamas, I believe, are involved in that are unfulfilled. Uh, time permitting, we can go through those. But what's, what, what it says is they're going to come together as a confederacy. They're going to try to wipe Israel off the map. They form a devious plan. We saw them try to do this in 1948. I don't believe that fulfilled it because Asaph petitions the Lord to deal with them. He, he draws our attention back to the book of Judges, chapters 4 through 8, the time of Midian, when Gideon destroyed 120,000 Midianites with his 300-man army, the time and they had oppressed Israel for seven years. Uh, when Gideon won that war, they no longer oppressed Israel. The Israeli Defense Forces were empowered. They defeated them. They took out the kings and the princes and 120,000 Midianites. And the Midianites never oppressed the Jews again. And to talk about the Canaanites who had oppressed the Jews for 20 years in Judges chapters 4 and 5, Deborah the prophetess had her general Brock destroy them and took out their king Jabin and their general Sisera, and the Canaanites never oppressed the Jews again. Well, in 1940, 1967, three, three major countries that were involved in 1948, also involved in Psalm 83, Egypt, Jordan and Syria came back and oppressed the Jews again in the Six Day War. So there's one of the reasons I don't think it was fulfilled in 1948. Hmm. Yeah, and and uh, and Bill, I would say that it, prophecy cyclical anyway. So uh, I think that's one of the reasons that that we in these systems, you've got some truth to historicism, you have truth to preterism, and you have truth to futurism, and a lot of times. Uh, the historic the historicist, the preterist, and the futurist may all be correct because if you just study the pattern, it's a cyclical type of pattern. It, it repeats itself. It, it's never mm. exactly fulfilled the same way it was in the past. So even if it was partially fulfilled in the future in the past, it doesn't mean if this is a prophecy that it won't be that it won't happen in the future. Well, I think it's I think it's a prophecy in process myself. And I use the example of the rebirth of the nation of Israel. You know, on May 14th, 1948, the world woke up to an Israel, restored nation of Israel. But for people who were paying attention could have realized that was forthcoming. You had, back in 1897, at the first Zionist Congress in Bashel with Theodor Herzl, he wanted to get the Jews back into their homeland to avoid what would become severe persecution, which, of course, he was right, it manifested in World War II. So you would have said, okay, now there's, because Bible prophecies talked about the return of the Jews back into the land, the restoration. Didn't tell us when. It told us the condition they would be in when they'd come back. We find that in Ezekiel 37. It says, our, our bones are dry, our hope is lost, and we ourselves are cut off. And he says, I'll open your graves, bring you back into the land of Israel. And Ezekiel 37, 10 says, and you'll become an exceedingly great army. And that army is becoming exceedingly great in the midst of what we've been watching in modern history here. But, Isn't that talking about both houses of Israel, Bill? 
the house of Israel, house of Israel and the house of Judah. I mean, we definitely have the house of Judah back in the land. I don't really think we could say we have the house of Israel. Yeah, the house of Israel is not gathered right? until the very end. And I know Doug and I would, would I mean, I, I've read your books and I, I, I know we would differ with your understanding um, that, uh, and my dad wrote books on, on, on dispensationalism pre-trib and he, he believed that only the Jews were Israel, whereas Doug and I, uh, we believe that what, that the, that the portion of Israel that's back in the land right now would be known as the house of Judah. And, and that they had to be gathered back to the land in order for pro prophecies like Zechariah 12, 13, and 14. But the house of Israel is prophesied and promised that they stay scattered until Mashiach, until, until, until Messiah returns. There's still some Jews in America. They're not going back. Messiah's going to have to supernaturally gather them. Uh, but, but obviously, you know, it's 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 more and more have made Aliyah and have moved to move back to the modern nation state of Israel. Well, if I can, I want to repeat. I want to go back to where I was at about the the process of Israel. Also, I would then I'll go to Isaiah 11, where I would tend to disagree with what you guys just said and point out why I do that. But let's go back to the process of Israel. And then we realize World War One. The, the Balfour Declaration comes out after the Ottoman Empire's is taken out of their control over the Middle East. And we see that Israel becomes, the land becomes prepared for the people, but they didn't get to go into the land. Then we see World War II comes along and the, the that war prepared the, the people for the land. And all of a sudden, 1948, we see them returning to the land. And, you know, people were paying attention because they said, hey, Israel is going to become a nation here pretty soon. Look at the events that are going on. So I think the same thing about Psalm 83, you know, we're, we're going to see it finally happen. But we've been seeing, you know, we should, can be paying attention. 1948, there was the war, the Palestinian refugees, the tents of Eden became a reality. Okay, now we have the lead player, their plight, and of course everyone wants a two-state solution. But the reality is that the prophecy in Psalm 83 is talking about a one-state solution. Verse 12 tells, tells us they want the pastures of God for themselves as a possession. So you have, they want to destroy the nation of Israel that the name can be remembered no more. And they want to have a, they want to take over the promised land for a one-state solution, not a two-state solution, in my estimation. And they're going to finally come together and try to do that, lay siege on Judah and Jerusalem. Obadiah 118 tells us when they do that, the house of Jacob, that would be the Israeli defense forces, will be a fire. The house of Joseph, the Israeli defense forces, will be a flame. But the house of Esau, Esau is the father of the Edomites, the tents of Edom, shall be stubble and no survivor shall remain, says in the house of Esau, thus says the Lord. And I can go through... A dozen. So you just said the house of Joseph, right? So Joseph awesome. and Judah are not the same. Is right, house right? of Jacob and, and then the house of Joseph, Obadiah 118. But it's talking about two different... Invol right? involved, involved in one clash together. I guess. It's interesting, the, the ancient rabbis thought that that mention there of Joseph was actually a reference to the Messiah, son of Joseph, uh, and that he would, uh, the Messiah, son of Joseph, would... Um, fight uh gog and magog which is uh which is an interesting thing but sorry um okay so uh, i i've taken us to isaiah 11 i'm i'd love to hear your perspective on this this is this is really fun okay well isaiah 11 11 talks about the regathering of the jewish people out of the nations of Assyria, Egypt, Petros, Cush, Elam, Elam which well, it is, speaks by the way, of it speaks of Israel and Judah right it does. Right. Yeah. It's the second time we gather, we gather. and Judah, right? So, well, it, it, it talks about as you get go down beyond that, it does mention that they will become one. Right. So no you have two becoming one. Yeah. They no longer right. will become a divided kingdom. Yeah. Just like right. in Ezekiel 37, do you believe that two stick prophecy was fulfilled in 48? I do. I believe this. I believe Isaiah 11, 11 was as well, because look what they do is once they come together, yeah. and they become one nation, which they are today, presuming both houses are back together, which I, I believe they are. Um, they come together, and they, but they shall fly down. They collectively, upon the shoulder of the Philistines toward the west, they shall plunder the people of the east, which could very well be Syria and Iraq. I'm not sure about that. And they lay their hand on Edom and Moab, which would be southern Jordan and, North, and central Jordan, which are part of Psalm 83. And the people of Ammon shall obey them. So I see that as a picture of an unfulfilled prophecy 
the, probably the Israeli Defense Forces flying down, which they can do now with the Israeli Air Forces, and taking out the Philistines toward the west, and also the broader reach out to the countries round about, Edom, Moab, and the people of the east. So so I, I think, I think who, in your right. opinion, is the House of Ephraim? I'm really curious about that. The house, I believe that all of Israel today is the two houses combined together, and they're no longer a divided kingdom. We know that the Jews are from the house of Judah. So who is Ephraim? Well, I would suggest you probably would know more about the split back when the two kingdoms, that was probably the ten tribes, right. of course. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, Judah and Benjamin would be the other two, correct? Well, but the kings, which most scholars would say was recorded and put together by Judah after they returned from Babylon, records several times that the house of Israel, Ephraim, also called the house of Joseph, was still in exile to this day. In other words, they never came back to, to Judah. And, and the rabbis, most of the rabbis actually understand this. They understand that, that Judah, what they called them, said, you know, Jews and Ephraim got scattered to the nations, swallowed up by the nations. Uh, Judah was not prophesied in Hosea 8 8. Uh, have you well, ever studied? We, we, can, we can agree to disagree. That's fine. Have, I mean, have you ever studied the distinctions, though? There's a lot of people who would agree with you, and there's a lot of people who would disagree with you. I just happen to disagree with that. Okay. I, think I think they're drawn out in Isaiah 11 uh, from a, ver a lot of various places. We're told the Elam, Shinar, Hamath, etc. I think that God, God knows who all of the descendants of Abraham are, the house of Jacob. And he's bringing them all He's into the land of Israel as one united nation. That's my opinion. Okay. I mean, it's interesting because Jesus actually uses that same, very same language uh, to speak of, you know, gathering, you know, and he's talking about in Matthew 24, uh, he, he's talking uh, about, you know, gathering the dispersed from the four corners of the earth. And, uh, you know, I've always assumed that he, you know, obviously he's God, you know, but still he's drawing from things that we find uh, in scripture already, right? He's going to have his angels go out, his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. So I don't know, it's just an interesting perspective. And um, I appreciate you coming and sharing with us, Bill. So, Well, you, you've probably heard my take on that before from other people. I'm not the only one who believes that Israel today involves, you know, all of the Jews, Ephraim and Judah and all that. I mean, Matter of fact, I think your take on that is probably a little more unique than my take on that. That's what, what I find. <laughs> Could be, but yeah, you know, in dispensational possibly. circles, no doubt. I love Chuck Missler, but he 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 somehow uh, came up with the when when a few from the northern tribes came and celebrated Passover together as that being a reunification of the two uh, of the of the two houses back into a united kingdom. Um, and there's no doubt Chronicles actually records that after Jeroboam went apostate and created his own feast days, uh, just like Roman Catholicism did, just uh, created his own uh, priesthood, just like Roman Catholicism did. The Levites all moved to Judah and a lot of the northern tribes that did not want to be involved in the apostate system, did not want to be involved in the idol worship they chronicles records that they moved south and they strengthened judah but you just never see anything i don't believe until the very very end when messiah returns that that the two houses are ultimately united well, how do you what do you do with 144,000 witnesses well they're not jews there's 12,000 that are from judah there's 12,000 from each tribe yeah, what oh, i'm saying is he has them united you have them united before the Messiah comes for the second coming. Well, again, so they're but, united before that time. But we're talking about 12 different tribes, not Jews. Well, House of Judah is among them. No, 100%. I mean, Judah, Benjamin's mentioned, Judah's mentioned, most of Levi was absorbed by Judah. But it one, it's one of my pet peeves, Bill, not, not against you, but when I hear... 144,000 Jews, it's like nails on the chalkboard. I'm like, no, the, the passage says 12,000 from each tribe. I mean, there's 12 gates into the New Jerusalem, and, and 
None of them are called the church or Christianity. There's 12 tribes. How do you get in? Well, I, I concur. There's 12, 12 tribes listed there. That's fine. But I mean, uh, how do, how do people, people do say this? How would people, they get in the gates? Which which gate did they go through? What are you, what are you talking about? What gate of what? You get into the New Jerusalem. There's only 12 gates and they're, and they're the 12 tribes. Christianity teaches that there's a Christian gate. I'm just asking you, what's your opinion as to how we, as if Christians, those that believe in Yeshua, that aren't, in your understanding, Israel, how to get inside the New Jerusalem? Can I just explain? Place. Can I just explain that to you when we get there? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's when we get there. Let me tell you, the foundations of the twelve apostles. I mean, you know, that's to me. I don't consider that a very important thing to be talking about in my estimation in light of what's going on presently in the world and in the Middle East. I think that's just a lot of semantics and things that I, I'm not that interested in personally. Okay. So we have a few questions. Uh, it'd be fun to kind of look at some of these. Um, this is uh, Jay Jones. She says, currently Damascus is already a shell of itself. Check it out. Uh, that's true. I mean, it, it certainly is not what it used to be. Do you, do you think we're seeing the destruction of Damascus or is it something that is still uh, yet future in a kind of a big event, if you will? Well, it still exists as a city, which Isaiah 17, one says it will no longer exist as a city. And two, the desolation in Isaiah 17, nine is caused by the children of Israel, not the dissenters in the Syrian revolution of Bashar al-Assad. I think, you know, I think it's in serious trouble right now. But again, Syria's rejoined the Arab League. They're trying to rebuild themselves. Russia and Turkey and Iran are meeting many times now after the revolution, trying to secure their interests, but also rebuild the, the territory of Syria. Uh, so I don't think it fulfilled that, the fact that it's a shell of a town right now. Hey, a question on Isaiah 17, though, because verse 7 says, In that day, man shall look to his maker and his eyes turn to the set-apart one, the Holy One of Israel. Again, you would have this happening seven years before, and there's a huge man is certainly not looking to his maker if you put this not at the very end of the age. How would, what would, your, how would you address that verse? I believe after the world sees what happens to Israel, the, fatness, the glory fading, the fatness of their flesh growing lean, uh, it'll be beginning a, a series of wake-up calls for mankind to be looking uh, more in that direction toward his maker. Uh, I'm, that's that's a little tougher couple okay. verses to, 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 to define, but trying to keep it all in the context of 18 verses all related to the destruction of Damascus, I would tend to say, much like in Ezekiel 38, uh, where it talks about Ezekiel 38 and 39, uh, 39.7 says, after, after the Lord stops Ezekiel 38 with a great earthquake, fire and brimstone, flooding rains, etc. He says, I will make my holy name known in the midst of my people Israel. They shall not profane it anymore. The nation shall know in the Lord, the Holy One in Israel. And I believe that's not a salvation awareness. I believe that's a, a awareness that, hey, that's the God of the Jews who just stopped the armies that approached and tried to invade Israel. So I think I think it's just, I, I wouldn't take it so literally that all of a sudden every man's going to look to his maker. Uh, in the context of Isaiah 17, I could be wrong. That's that is a tougher verse. Yeah, it's just that phrase in that day. In that day, uh, it, I don't know if you've ever. I mean, I, I I believe that when 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 Scripture is talking about in that day, it's speaking of the seventh day or the one thousand year period, the millennium, because each day is just as a thousand years. And we're not having. I don't think we're having this conversation right now, Bill. Uh, because, and what happened on the eighth great day or the last great day of the feast uh, in 2023, by coincidence, that it's been about 1.993-ish days since Yeshua, Jesus, ascended and returned to his place. I mean, everything is converging and aligning. And Doug made a comment earlier about what's different about 2005. You know, my brain started screaming. It was 18 years ago, you know, <laughs> at, at that point in time. We, you know, you were, we were still 25 ish years away from 2030, give or take a few years. So I don't think this is, this is occurring at this time by coincidence. Well, if, you, if you're going to say in that day goes where you just put it, that takes the destruction of Damascus 
way out to where you put it way out in the future. I think I in that day, it. in that day means in that day that Damascus is destroyed. Yeah, I would put in that day, in that final seventh day, that final seven thousand, that final one thousand year period. In other words, after mm -hmm. after the gathering, after the elect are gathered, after we are called up, at, and, and, and you probably know this, Doug and I are would be more pre wrath, post uh, great tribulation, uh, and that that's when uh, in that day. In other words, the sixth day ends, the seventh day begins, the 1,000 year long day, the millennium, the resurrection has occurred. And then it that's when all these things happen. That's my understanding. It's the, it's the transition between this age and the next age, <laughs> which obviously the return of Jesus will be, uh, you know, front and center at that. It, it, when I've looked at the term uh, Bayom Hahu in that day, it seems to always refer to the day of the Lord, the great day of the Lord. You see it in Isaiah chapter two, you know, talking about in that day, you know, he alone will be exalted, etc. And so, you know, just kind of based on that, you know, specifically Isaiah using this term, kind of setting the precedence for that in Isaiah chapter two, if we then follow that through, that, that would suggest that, you know, Bayom Hahuba in that day would be the same reference to the great day of the Lord, the day that he comes back, uh, as it's used there in Isaiah chapter two. So, and in that day, the, the wolf will lie down with the lamb, you know, the, the adder, the snake will no longer, you know, children will play with snakes. I just view that as the next stage, uh, sort of like a, uh, an Edenic state, not quite Edenic yet, but but definitely better than we're, the age we're living in right now. But that, the first part of that day ain't going to be pretty. <laughs> I think the verse you quoted is relevant to the Messianic kingdom about the lion, about the the creatures being in you know, peace and non carnivorous with each other. I, I would agree with that. I just think, I take this more literally. I think in that day, centered around when Damascus gets destroyed, it's mentioned, I think, four times in that day. Uh, I think that's where we have to focus. When Damascus gets destroyed, there's all the additional details to that prophecy. That's my my take on it. Awesome. Uh, so our, our friend uh, Brad Myers has a question. Uh, he says, what is the historical evidence, Doug, <laughs> asking me, okay, uh, that uh, I guess that's Nebuchadnezzar II or Alexander the Great caused a great disaster that resulted in the Elamites being scattered to many countries at that time in Jeremiah 49, 35 through 37. Um. Oh. That's a very specific question. Brad, Brad asked that question. Uh, okay. Well, let me just give you the backstory on that. Brad has yeah. done a lot of research. A friend of he introduced us, Doug, as you mentioned earlier. Yeah. Uh, he's done a lot of research for my new book, Future War Prophecies, and we address the objections to Psalm eighty-three. We object to address the objections to why Isaiah seventeen was not historically fulfilled, but is a future prophecy. And we also addressed why. The Jeremiah chapter 49 verses 34 through 39 prophecy was not historically fulfilled by Nebuchadnezzar and around the Babylonian period. Uh, some held to that was Mark Hitchcock, Andy Woods, Dr. David Reagan. Recently, between Brad's research and my research and our email volley, volleys back and forth to Mark Hitchcock, he has since realized he's wrong, and he's admitted that to me about two weeks ago at a conference we were together at in Orlando, which means everyone who was parroting him, Andy Woods and David Reagan are also wrong. And so Brad put together this incredible research that would take a whole show to go over with you. So Brad, I'm, I can't believe you asked that question. But basically we re, we've come to the realization that uh, it's a future war prophecy, Jeremiah 49. And that's another one we should be looking for right now because it talks about a disaster in Iran, mm -hmm. different prophecy than Ezekiel 38. Iran is double trouble in the end times. And mm -hmm. that's the area where the, that hugs the Persian Gulf. It's where all Iran's underground missile silos, portable rocket launchers, their hypersonic missiles, their underground air base. They got a nuclear mm -hmm. reactor there. Their missile defense systems. That's all. They're all set right there in place. And it talks about a prophecy where the Lord is fiercely angry with the leadership of Iran. I believe that's right now because they want to wipe Israel off the map. He's going to break the bow of Elam at the foremost of their might, so they can't launch something lethal somewhere, which would probably be a nuclear weapon at Israel. And it says it will create a disaster, a huge disaster, because the Lord is fiercely angry. 
And the nature of the disaster creates a humanitarian crisis because it says all the Edomites will flee into all the nations of the world. There'll be no nations where they don't go. So that's the prophecy I think that is part of probably going to dovetail together with Isaiah 17. And I think after those two, ultimately Psalm 83 would come together when the Arab countries go, wow, Israel took out Damascus. What's to stop them from taking out Berlin, uh, Beirut, Amman, Jordan? What's to stop them from taking out Mecca? What's to stop them from taking out Cairo? And by the way, Israel's hurt. His glory fades. His flesh waxes lean. He's like a shaking of an olive tree. And Amman, Jordan should be concerned because their peace treaty is about to be voided. Jeremiah 49.2 says, There'll be an alarm of war in Rabbah of the Ammonites. That's Amman, Jordan. It shall be a desolate mound. And Israel shall take possession of his inheritance. Zephaniah 2, verses 8 through 9, a different camera angle of that prophecy, both unfulfilled as of yet. And you said some of your, uh, like Mark Hitchcock and them, were actually trying to say that Jeremiah 49, this prophecy, had been fulfilled in the past? Yeah. yeah. Wow. That's surprising because it says right there Why? that it will be in the <laughs> end times. I mean, I mean, it says right there at the end. I mean, I don't think that this is referring to something in the past. He says uh, it should come to pass in the latter days, right? So, well, they they skirt around that. They say it was partially <laughs> partially fulfilled well, in the past. Since since Brett since Brett asked me, uh, I guess you know I'll address it. Brett, I don't think that's speaking of something that's past. I think that's something that's yet future. Well, in fact, I think a lot of the things in the end of Jeremiah, he's talking about the future destruction of Babylon. And I would argue that Babylon uh, has never been destroyed as described in the Bible, uh, that God himself would destroy it in an hour. You know, if we look at Revelation 17 and 18 in a bit more literal fashion, I would say it's never been destroyed like that. In fact, what we do see is that after Alexander the Great came in and conquered it, he did not destroy the city. I need to make that very, very, very clear. The city was never destroyed. So what happened to it? Well, it sort of just faded away. Okay. It kind of just decayed. And then the Romans came in and took it over. I think it was Hadrian, if I remember correctly, uh, that went in and, you know, he had actually conquered Babylon at that time. And he's like, oh, what's all the fuss about? Right. So he's taking a look at Babylon and he was expecting this really grand metropolis that he had conquered. And it turns out it wasn't that impressive. So it was never destroyed in an hour like god says i'm gonna do this to you it just sort of wasted away so that is why you know my position is that a, a city called babylon in the area of iraq is going to be rebuilt in the last days and then god is actually going to destroy it uh, just like he said he's going to do so that's my take on it so since you asked brad eh, you're wrong <laughs> See, Bill, I told you, I don't, I, it's not just guess. I disagree with Doug. All the time. <laughs> or I believe you're wrong, Doug. How about that? I'll be nice. There you go. Thank you. Thank you. That makes me feel a lot better. Okay. There's, Doug, there's a lot of people who think Babylon's going to be rebuilt. I, 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 I split up Revelation 17 as ecclesiastical Babylon. I believe that's centered in Rome. And I think there's there clues for that. And I think after it's desolated by 10 kings in Revelation 17, 16. They give all their power and all of the wealth of the Vatican and whatever over to the Antichrist. And then you turn to Revelation 13, where he comes on the scene and in the mid part of the trib, his mark of the beast comes into play. Then you shift to Revelation 18, commercial Babylon. Whether that's in literal rebuild Babylon, whether that's Rome, whether that's New York City, whether that's Mecca, like Joe Richardson would say, or whether that's Jerusalem, like Chris White would say, that's up for debate. I personally think it's Rome in 17 and Rome in 18, but a lot of other people do think Rome, it's literal Babylon, Revelation 18. Well, and we know, Bill, from the Daniel 2 statue that Rome actually never went, went away. I mean, it's, it's the iron legs, and then you have the, the, the feet and the, and the iron mixed with miry clay. Mm -hmm. and, and, so you, and, and that empire is not destroyed until Yeshua returns. So again, Rome has morphed, uh, and 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 to your point about Babylon, spiritual. Doug Doug's looking at a literal city, and I see Babylon as the spiritual component of this. The all the false religions, uh, uh, Islam would be one of them. People keep on bringing up Islam, but that would be a false religion. Uh, Buddhism, Taoism, all these. Any Satan doesn't care how he gets you. 
you know, he doesn't care how he deceives you. Uh, you know, one, one false religion is as good as another in, in his book. So and I would agree I that, you know, ecclesiastical Babylon and, and Revelation 17, you know, I, I just think that we have a very clear reference to Babylon uh, actually being, you know, a real city. Little newsflash here for some people. Uh, the the third largest, uh, no, the second, what was it the second or third largest uh, Jewish population in the first century was, drumroll, Babylon. Okay. So when Peter is actually writing to those in Babylon, you know, he's speaking to those in Babylon. He's not, it's not a code word for Rome. And I know that's what a lot of people have thought, but again, we didn't come here to debate that. So, but I just can't help, you know, but defending my little thesis. So, um, but it's all right. <laughs> you know, call it a pet peeve. Um, you know, but it's all part of the fun. So, man, we are, we're out of time. I, I hate to say it, but we're out of time. Bill, thank you for coming on. Um, again, people can go to Prophecy Depot, Prophecy Depot, as a T at the end of that, prophecy, prophecydepot.com, and uh, get um, Bill's teachings, get his books. Um, you know, I don't agree with everything, but I think it's worth a read. You know, that's all part of the fun. We're all here to learn, and none of us has a corner on the market despite what we might want to say, right? But, uh, you know, and the, the, the cool thing is that when the Lord comes, he's going to probably take us all and say, come here, I, I, I got to tell you some things. And we're and, like, oh, okay. And, and I don't think our kingdom status is going to be elevated because of, because we got it all right. I think it might be, it, we might lose some, some, some points and have some stuff burn up in the pyre because <laughs> of the way we treat people that we differ with. In other words, you know, like uh, I like to ask some hard questions and everything, but we can we can disagree and talk. Hey, at least we're talking about about what's going on in the world right now. Well, yeah, and we do it in a way where we show that we're brothers in the Lord. We're, yeah, that's all that matters. Yeah. And iron sharpens iron, and that's that's all important right now. I'm in. I'm in. Well, again, Bill, thank you for coming on. Everyone, go to Prophecy Depot, check out Bill's stuff. Uh, until next time want to wish you a good evening stay in the word and make sure that you treat someone way jesus has treated you which is pretty darn awesome all right till next time god bless you <laughs>